against uh, Richard Nixon. You lost by a wide margin. Why run again for the presidency in 1984? Well, I suppose for the same reason I ran 10 years ago, I'm not at all satisfied with the course our country is pursuing at the present time. I think we're on a, a mistaken course, both in terms of our foreign policy today and also uh, the way we're addressing our problems here at home. I felt very strongly about similar matters 10 years ago. I ran at a time when it looked like I didn't have a chance uh, to win the Democratic presidential nomination. I started out at 4% in the polls, way behind uh, the late Senator Humphrey, former Vice President Humphrey, Senator Ed Muskie and others, but I won the Democratic nomination. And even though I lost to uh, Richard Nixon in the fall, I really don't feel like a loser. I think there are some things that are worse than losing the vote count. I, I wouldn't want to trade places with the winner of that 72 election, and I think Although I failed on the vote count, I did succeed in that candidacy in forcing an end to the war in Vietnam. That was the transcendent issue of the 1970s. Today, the issues are different, but I feel equally strong about them. Our guest for the next hour is George McGovern, candidate for the presidency in 1984 and director of the Americans for Common Sense. Our phone lines will be open uh, throughout this hour for our viewers in Eastern and Central time zones. It's 202-628-2525. And those of you in Pacific and Mountain time zones, 202-783-2727. You're all probably very familiar with George McGovern, but I'll give you some background information. Uh, he received his BA degree from Dakota Wesleyan University. Uh, during World War II, he served as a pilot of a B-24 bomber in the European theater. After the war, he received his PhD in history and government at Northwestern University. In 1956, elected to the U.S. House. 1960, President Kennedy named him the first director of U.S. Food for Peace program. And in 1962, he was elected to the U.S. Senate, where he served for three terms ran for the presidency and lost in 72 and in 1980 was defeated in his fourth uh, election or when he was running for his fourth term as a U.S. Senator. He's now running for President of the United States uh, second time around and he'll be with us for one hour to discuss that campaign. We were just watching the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, when you were in the Senate, you were a member of that committee. They voted to go along with the President and allow, uh, during looking at the War Powers Resolution, allow him to keep U.S. forces in Lebanon for 18 more months. Would you agree with that? It's a, it's a tragic mistake. And I'm going to predict without any fear of hesitation at all that the uh, Senate will live to regret that vote today. Uh, we devised the War Powers Act very carefully at the end of the Vietnam War. It was authored on a bipartisan basis by Democrats and Republicans alike. The purpose was to prevent this very thing from happening of delegating power to the president to conduct an executive war without any real input uh, from the Congress of the United States. I think the founding fathers who wrote the war powers into the, con into the Constitution and placed that war-making power clearly in the hands of the Congress must be turning over in their graves today. Uh, it's a great mistake uh, to let the president send forces abroad into a highly confusing and I think mistaken uh, enterprise like this religious war in Lebanon, and that's what it's fast becoming, and then give him 18 months to do what he wants with it. The Democrats on the committee voted to give him six months to keep the forces there. Would you agree with six months? I wouldn't have extended the War Powers Act at all. I think it's a very reasonable act. What it says is that if the president finds, after committing forces to battle, that hostilities are imminent, in other words, that there's a danger that it might erupt into a uh, active combat activities, he should make such a finding to the Congress. Then under the terms of the War Powers Act, the Congress has 90 days to debate that proposition and to make a judgment, both in the Senate and in the House, as, as to whether they want the forces to continue. If in their judgment, after um, careful debate and hearings and examination, it's in the national interest, for the forces to continue, then under the War Powers Act, they can so vote. But they should never relinquish that power for six months, 12 months, 18 months, for any period of time beyond that provided in the War Powers Act. Our guest for the next hour, George McGovern, candidate for the presidency in 1984. Arlington, Virginia, you're our first call. Go ahead, please. All right. Uh, I want to con comment on Senator McGovern's attitude toward communists and the Russian government. Uh, during the Vietnam War, 
Uh, Sandra, you stated that you would go to Hanoi and get down on your knees and beg for the release of American POs, P, POWs. And then recently in the Washington Post, you stated that, and I quote, I think that this man, Antipas, seems to be a reasonable guy and somewhat restrained, unquote. I have two questions. If you were present today, would you go to Moscow and get down on your knees and beg for reparations to the families of the victims of, on KAL 7 Arlington, Virginia, let's let him answer that one. Go ahead. Right. I think uh, President Reagan handled it very properly. He made clear uh, in his request that he expected the Soviet government to make reparations uh, for the uh, loss of the Americans who were killed on that plane. And I endorse the uh, president's efforts. I don't endorse some of his other uh, reactions to this incident, but I think that was a proper one. With regard to the uh, earlier question, I never at any time said that I would go to Hanoi on my knees. That was a press interpretation report by a right-wing uh, reactionary writer. Uh, what I said was the same thing that President Eisenhower said when he was seeking the presidency in 1952 and we were involved in the Korean War. He said, if I am elected, I'm going to go to Korea and I'm going to pursue the cause of peace. That's precisely what I said with regard to Vietnam, that if I were elected and I thought it would save the life of one single American boy, I would be more than happy to journey any place in Vietnam in pursuit of peace. And I stand on that statement with honor 10 years later. Salinas, California, you're on the air with George McGovern. Go ahead, please. Okay, I have two difficult questions relating to domestic policies. One is uh, what does the Senator McGovern think of the irrigation law, the reclamation law, if you will, and what's happened to it in the last two or three years under the president's administration? And what does the senator think of nuclear power and as two jobs and its effects on the society? With regard to uh, the irrigation law, I think we should have stayed with the original Reclamation Act that limited uh, subsidized uh, government irrigation to the family type operators. I don't think it was ever the intention of Theodore Roosevelt, the great conservationist, and of other uh, people who were responsible for the Reclamation Act of 1902, uh, for that act to be uh, extended to cover uh, government subsidies to huge corporate uh, agricultural interests. So I'm disturbed about the current trend away from the original part of that act. As for nuclear power, I would not close down the existing nuclear plants as long as they meet careful uh, safety um, inspection requirements. Neither do I think it's wise for this country to invest in new nuclear plants until two things happen. First of all, until we know what to do with the waste that is accumulated from these plants, uh, a problem which we haven't yet resolved. And secondly, until we can find some way to eliminate the danger of accidents uh, in these plants at a reasonable cost. I don't know whether you're aware of the fact that it now costs in excess of three billion dollars to design and build a single nuclear plant. With the same amount of money uh, invested in solar energy or in methods to find safe ways of burning coal, I think we'd get infinitely more energy with more safety for the public. You're one of seven uh, Democrats running for the presidency. Uh, you announced after the other six did. Announcing so late, does that put you at an automatic disadvantage to the other people? Well, I suppose it does. It's always better to begin the race the same time the other runners uh, start. Uh, there's an interesting aspect about that. Up until I announced for the presidency in 1971, in January of 71, that was the earliest presidential announcement in American history. Nobody had ever said two years ahead of the election that they were going to run for the presidency. But after I broke the precedent of waiting until the election year, now people announce one, two, three, even four years ahead of the election. I think some of these candidates were off and running uh, almost before we counted the votes in 1980. So I suppose it's uh, somewhat of a disadvantage for me to start as late as I did. On the other hand, I've been reading the press and discovered that some of these early starters are already a million dollars in debt. 
I'm at least starting with a clean slate. I don't owe anybody any money. And I do think my name is well enough known, having been through one presidential campaign and having won the Democratic nomination, so that perhaps it's not too big a handicap that I start a little later. Back to the phones. Minnesota, you're on the air with George McGovern. Uh, Mr. McGovern, I'm a 15-year-old Democrat from Minnesota, and I, I, just want, I just wanted to say that I think what you're doing is really great, and uh, I was wondering, what are you going to do if you um, don't win? Are you going to keep in uh, uh, public policy, or uh, are you just going to retire? Minnesota, if I could ask you, if uh, you were old enough to vote, would you vote for George McGovern for president in 84? kind of torn. I, I, was, I want to campaign for someone, but I'm not real sure. I'm kind of undecided. I, I guess I want the Democratic Party to kind of decide for me. Okay. I'm really interested in politics. And possible campaign worker. Thank you very much. Well, it's, uh, it's a marvelous question and a marvelous answer from a 15-year-old in Minnesota, one of my favorite states, by the way, next to where I grew up in, in South Dakota. Um, as to the question what I will do if I lose, obviously I go into this race hoping that I will win. You don't want to spend too much energy uh, thinking about what you're going to do if you lose. A runner who uh, spends all the time looking behind him uh, to see who's uh, chasing him or spends all the time uh, wondering what he's going to do the next time if he doesn't win this race probably won't win anything. However, uh, I have thought that if things don't work out uh, in 1984. Uh, there are a number of interesting things I might like to do. Uh, one, I wouldn't mind having a television program like this. I may come in and apply for your job after, if I don't win in 1984. I've thought about writing a syndicated column. I've thought about maybe taking some other post in the, um, in the government. I love diplomacy. Maybe I'll apply for an ambassador's uh, job. I'm sure there are a lot of interesting things uh, to do. And I do appreciate your concern about what happens if I lose, but please help me win. If I decide to run for president in the future, I'll let you know we can just switch then, perhaps. Why not? Los Angeles, California, you're next. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, thank you for having uh, Mr. McGovern on there. And let me say that I voted for him back there uh, when it was important, and uh, he made a difference in, in what happened there in, in Vietnam. Would you vote for him again in 84? Uh, Let's put it this way. I'm, I'm looking right now, a lot, like a lot of other Americans are looking. Uh, I see no one that has been in the race that has really excited anyone. And for that reason, I'm really glad that George McGovern is there. He articulates the issues and makes them very clear. My question is, is that I'm a grassroots organizer here in Southern California. And uh, what we are looking for, and there's a large cons a constituency of people out here that want to get rid of Ronald Reagan and his economic policies. I work in the inner city of L.A. I watch people, the elderly, eating out of garbage cans. Uh, I see our inner city schools where our kids are killing each other with guns. Uh, there's a, when I have worked in the streets and I have the pulse of the people pretty well, a large portion are are afraid to become involved politically because our local police have been spying on the, the citizens and the activists inside of the community here. We have other people that are have given up, they've lost hope, and I'm wondering what issues uh, you can articulate here to, that can activate and help us activate the people that are being most hurt by Reaganomics. Los Angeles, thank you very much. I think this is a, a marvelous question. You know, when um, President Reagan said during the campaign before he was elected that he wanted to get Uncle Sam off our backs, I think a lot of people thought what he meant by that is just eliminate some of the bureaucratic red tape, uh, some of the waste in government and so on. I don't think they anticipated that what he had in mind was slashing the school lunch program, eliminating three million uh, young children from that program, slashing the a food stamp program in such a way as to work a real hardship on a great many of our poor uh, families. Cutting back on uh, public support for education while proposing to fund uh, private schools with an open record of racism. Uh, the, the uncertainty that's been added to our older people as to whether their future is going to be uh, secured. And perhaps most serious of all, doing nothing effective about the fact that 12 or 13 million Americans can't find a job. To me, 
That is the most serious uh, domestic problem facing this country today, that 12 or 13 million people are, are out of work and can't find jobs. If I were elected as President of the United States, the first thing I would do is call in the leaders of industry and labor and agriculture and attempt to dent identify the most urgent jobs that need to be done in this country, building up our cities, improving our streets, our water systems, our recreational facilities, doing something about the collapse of our uh, rail systems. And I believe we could design a program of cooperative job efforts on the part of government and industry that would put millions of people that are now out of work uh, back on the job. And furthermore, they would be doing things that make life better for all of the citizens of this country. Uh, carefully thought out uh, jobs projects, uh, in my judgment, would be the best investment this country could make. Nine o'clock this evening, our live call-in guest will be Sami Merhe, who is president of the American Druze Society. The Druze Muslim Militia is the group involved in the shelling of Beirut, currently in Lebanon. Please join us for that show at nine o'clock this evening. Our guest right now is George McGovern in Orlando, Florida. You're on the air. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I had two questions for the senator. Uh, I was wondering if he felt that French and British missiles should be included in the current START talks. And I was also hoping that he would comment on some of the tactics used by Right to Life and other groups in his last election bid and their role in American politics. Thank you. Yes, on the uh, first question, uh, I don't think there's any way to get uh, an agreement with the Soviet Union, particularly on intermediate range missiles, without including the French and British missiles uh, with the Americans in determining what the Western balance is. Uh, when the Soviet military planners look at Western Europe and count the number of missiles that are aimed at them, uh, obviously they're going to count missiles in, in France and Britain as well as the American missiles. So I think sooner or later, uh, if we want to get a workable agreement with the Soviet Union on the number of missiles that are permissible uh, in the Soviet Union and in Western Europe, uh, we have to count the French and the British missiles uh, as well. There's room for some compromise uh, on this, but I think uh, both the Americans and the Russians do want an agreement, and I'm very hopeful that uh, the President will stick with the course he's presently on of not letting this recent uh, airplane tragedy uh, throw us off the track on uh, arms negotiations. On the uh, question of the tactics, of some of the uh, radical right groups, I think the great mistake these uh, groups make is focusing on a single issue and ignoring everything else uh, in the achievements as well as in the failures of public figures. In my judgment, a United States senator or congressman ought to be judged uh, on their total record. Uh, it's very hard to find a public official that we can agree with 100%. I've never been able to find one. Uh, that I could agree with 100%. But if I agree with them a reasonable percentage of the time on most of the things they're doing, if I think they're the kind of public official who on most issues will come down on the side that I think is right, I can vote for that person even though they disappoint me on uh, certain aspects of my own convictions. In 1980, uh, you were running for your fourth term and you were defeated along with several other more liberal Democratic senators. In 84, there's some talk that the Democrats may have a chance of regaining control of the Senate, which was lost in that 80 election. Do you think the Democratic Party will regain control of the Senate in 84? I think they've got a good chance uh, at recapturing the Senate. The, uh, the death of Senator Jackson, a leading Democrat uh, in uh, the state of Washington, one of the most respected members of the United States Senate, will hurt the Democrats. He had that seat locked. He, was won, he had won by a big margin. I think he would have stayed there had he lived uh, as long as he wished. That, um, that seat uh, could be lost to the uh, Democrats, although there will be uh, an election at some point to replace uh, Senator Jackson. If I had to bet tonight, uh, I would say that the Democrats uh, might recover the uh, Senate in 1984 by uh, a one-vote margin. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee's uh, debate and vote on the War Powers Resolution, which took place earlier today, will be shown to you in its entirety beginning at 10 o'clock p.m. East Coast time here on C-SPAN. Santa Clara, California, you're on the air with George McGovern. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, Senator McGovern. Hello. I had an opportunity to speak to you um, about a year ago when you were at Santa Clara University, and there were two issues that I 
asked you then that I'd like to ask you again. One deals with uh, the issue of a national youth service program. Now, you mentioned unemployment, and the area that's very striking is teenage unemployment, and a national youth service program could help address that. Um, currently, in the House, there is a bill to set up a commission to look at the ramifications of a national youth service program, and it's in the Rules Committee currently. And Senator Sangas is going to introduce a resolution or a bill um, next week. I was wondering if this is the first question, if you plan on talking about this issue and making it part of your campaign strategy. And the second question deals with another issue that I'm working on, and that's the proposal to have some kind of official U.S., USSR negotiations or summit talks in Hiroshima, Japan. Okay. I was wondering if you plan on giving any kind of public remarks or speeches in regards to this concept. Santa Clara, thank you very much. Uh, with regard to the uh, first proposal, uh, I think you're quite right that young people do have special problems today in the, uh, in the job market, particularly the minority uh, youth. Uh, the unemployment rate is higher among young people than it is uh, those in the middle range. So I think the uh, Zongas proposal and the one that you endorse for special attention to the youth in some kind of national youth program perhaps including uh, the idea of the old Civilian Conservation Corps that we had back in the 1930s to engage uh, young people in conservation practices, the upgrading of our forests and parks and so on. Uh, that kind of program I would generally endorse. I haven't specifically uh, looked at the details of the Zongas bill, but he's a very thoughtful senator, and I usually find myself in agreement with the things that he uh, uh, proposes. With regard to uh, the possibility of a Soviet-U.S. summit talk in, uh, in Hiroshima, I can only say based on my own experience that that's a sobering uh, experience for any thoughtful person to go through, to see those mass graves where a hundred thousand people were uh, incinerated. And as a matter of fact, it's not such a far out idea to suggest that the uh, leaders of the two superpowers that are capable of sowing Hiroshima tragedies all over the world uh, have a joint meeting on the site of that uh, terrible tragedy of 1945. If you were elected president, would you move to have a summit meeting with Yuri Andropov? I would indeed. I think, uh, uh, I think the uh, president of the United States, President Reagan, uh, would serve the cause of his own country and the cause of peace uh, if he would move ahead with such discussions. I, uh, I know and I understand the anguish of my fellow citizens over the shooting down of that uh, Korean airliner. There are a lot of people that think that means we never again uh, should talk to the Soviet Union. That is not my own view. I think that tragedy underscores the importance of trying to get on a stronger uh, dialogue with the uh, Soviets to try to see if we can't find a way in direct talks to release some of this terrible tension that's building up between the two countries. I think the more we move towards a kind of a hair trigger uh, extreme tension between the two countries, the more we run the risk of incidents of the kind we've just had. The next time it might be a nuclear weapon that's used in a misjudgment of that kind. So yes, um, if I were President of the United States, I would miss no opportunity for direct head-to-head -head talks with the leader of the other superpower. Harrison, New York, thanks for waiting, and you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Yes, Senator McGovern, I just wanted to ask you if you could compare U.S. involvement in Lebanon today with United States involvement in Vietnam during the 60s and 70s. It's quite a different situation. Uh, uh, first of all, I think the uh, uh, intervention in Lebanon was done in a multilateral way. We went in with the French and with the Italians in what was supposed to be a peacekeeping uh, operation. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I uh, endorse what we're doing in Lebanon. I think it's very dangerous to inject American military forces on the ground uh, in Lebanon at a time when that country is racked with what appears to be an almost hopeless religious war. The Marines were sent in there, as you will recall, after the destruction of the refugee camps about a year ago. They were supposed to restore uh, some measure of order uh, in the country and then get out after a few weeks time. I don't think anyone envisioned that they would still be there a year later. Meanwhile, 
the government of uh, Lebanon is under pressure from Syria. They're under pressure from the returning Palestinians. And within their own country, you have Muslims, the Druze, uh, as this particular group is called, in bitter combat, combat with the Christian phalangist government that is, seems to be in control of Beirut. Under those conditions, I think what President Reagan ought to do is to invoke the War Powers Act, uh, trigger a careful and thoughtful debate in the Congress of the United States as to what our policy should be, but in the meantime, press for a ceasefire, if that's at all possible, in concert with our allies in Lebanon, and then if there's any kind of a grace period at all, get those Marines out just as rapidly as we can. 7 o'clock this evening, C-SPAN will bring you Secretary of State George Shultz testimony this past Wednesday before the House Foreign Affairs Committee on the current situation in Lebanon. Century City, California, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Oh, yes, I'm so glad to be able to speak to uh, Senator McGovern. Thank you. Uh, he, uh, when he was running in 72, why, uh, he made an announcement one night, uh, a speech, and uh, he s made the announcement that if he were elected president, he would have the men home from Vietnam within 90 days and, and, the, and where they belong, he said, and all of the prisoners of war. So the next morning, I ran out, I told all the neighbors and everybody I saw, I said, the war is going to be over. And they said, what, what are you talking about? And I said, because my, Mr. Uh, Senator McGovern last night made the announcement, and I said, they know he's a person of his word. And I said, you watch how fast Nixon stops this war. And it really wasn't three days until Nixon said, now we're going to, the war is going to be over. And because he wanted to get elected above all cost, and I knew that you'd do what you said, and so at least... You saved many, many, many lives by that. Century City, would you vote for George McGovern in 84? You bet, and I'm going to be out. I'm a former South Dakotian okay. from Rapid okay. City, but, but I didn't know him, and that really has anything to do with it, really. Okay. Century but, City, uh, let's give him a chance to respond. Appreciate no, the call, though. Thank you. Well, I'm delighted with the uh, caller's observation. I have always thought that the repeated pledges I made in 1972 to end the war uh, within 90 days after the election, if I were elected, put enormous public pressure on President Nixon to do precisely what he did, and that's to have the Secretary of State, Mr. Kissinger, announce just one week before the election that peace was at hand. He said uh, maybe one more negotiating session to work out a few of the semantic details and we'll have a peace treaty. Unfortunately, when the election was over, the uh, Nixon administration launched the most murderous aerial bombardment of the war against Hanoi. It didn't accomplish a thing except to kill a lot of people, to destroy a huge uh, civilian hospital, to lay waste of the homes and the buildings of Hanoi, and to slaughter a great many innocent uh, people. That never would have happened if I had been elected in 72. As a matter of fact, we could have settled the war in Vietnam on the same terms we got in 1973, five years before that. That's the great tragedy. Our guest is George McGovern. He was born in 1922 in Avon, South Dakota. He's 61 years old. He's married and he has five children. He's with us for about a half hour more to discuss his campaign for the presidency in 1984. <laughs> Canton, Ohio, go ahead, please. Oh, hello, Senator McGovern. Hello. Uh, I'm sure good to see you on there. Thank you. <laughs> and I was I listened to that Senate debate today about the War Power Act, and I am absolutely disgusted when a president doesn't have to obey the rules, the laws. It's on the books. Why does he think that he isn't accountable, that the laws doesn't interfere with his laws? Well, I must say I share your sense of... Uh disappointment, if not outright disgust, with what happened in the Congress today. Uh, it, that what the Congress did, if this stands, now keep in mind this is just the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee. The Senate hasn't yet voted on it as a body. But if, if this stands and the uh, Senate and the House vote to exempt the President from the War Powers Act, I think everyone that votes that way is going to live to regret it because this war in Lebanon is going to get out of hand. Uh, 1,200 Marines are not enough to
to stabilize the kind of wartime bitterness and hatred that is erupting uh, in Lebanon. That is not our responsibility. We are not responsible for policing uh, matters in, in Lebanon. That is the responsibility of the government of Lebanon uh, itself. It certainly is not the obligation of these young Marines that we've sent over there on a peacekeeping mission, not on a war-making uh, mission. And I think the Congress is making a dreadful mistake in effect telling the President that he is exempt from the terms of the War Powers Act. The War Powers Act would have given him 90 days to get those forces out of uh, Lebanon, and it would have put the pressure on him to do whatever he has to do to disengage those forces. Now, if the Congress uh, does complete this action of giving the President a year and a half before he comes under the terms of the War Powers Act, God only knows what's going to happen to those boys that we have uh, caught up in this fighting, and I'm afraid many more that will be uh, uh, sent in the weeks ahead. So I share your sense of uh, of disgust over what was uh, done uh, in the Foreign Relations Committee today. Missoula, Montana, good afternoon. Are you with us, Missoula, Montana? Yes, this is Missoula, Montana. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Okay, I'd like to ask uh, Senator McGovern uh, what happened on this uh, five cents a gallon that uh, they supposedly our government took out to put everybody to work. There seems to be less construction going on now. They have our five cents a gallon, and we definitely need work. Uh, and if he had any other projects that uh, he thought that if he was president, that he could put some people to work, we desperately, desperately need to get to work. And it's just, uh, that's about what I had to ask him. Well, the, the gentleman is absolutely right. And I, I think his, uh, first of all, his disappointment that we haven't done more with the uh, gas tax that, w that was collected is well taken. Obviously, the roads need to be upgraded all over this country. There's a whole range of other things that, uh, that need to be done. I happen to know that area out around Missoula, Montana, where the caller lives. I know the areas out in South Dakota and Iowa and that area where I come from. I know that the railroads are falling apart uh, in that part of the country. There was a time when the United States had the finest rail system in the world. We depended on it in the Second World War and the First World War as a vital link in our whole defense system. Now we've permitted this once great rail system to fall into disrepair. A number of the lines have bankrupt. Uh, there's no passenger service in large parts of the country. One of the things that I have declared I would attempt to do if I were President of the United States is to form uh, the best commission I could appoint of business, industry, and labor uh, people working with the government to lay out a plan uh, to give the United States the finest rail system in the world. It would create millions of jobs. It would stimulate the agricultural economy. It would stimulate the shipping industry. It would help restore the vitality of our towns all across this country. That's just one of a great many things that need to be done. Our waterways need to be upgraded our sewage systems, our city streets, alternative energy systems. There's a whole range of things that we ought to be doing instead of frittering away uh, the resources of this country in ill-advised foreign interventions abroad. George McGovern served in the Senate from 1962 through 1980, and while in the Senate, he served on the Agriculture Committees, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the Joint Economic Committee, and also the Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs. Gainesville, Florida, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I admired your create, courageous stand in 1972 on homosexual rights, and I was wondering, are you still keep, are you still supporting that, them I'm, right now? I'm for the rights of every American. I'm not involved in their lifestyles. That's a judgment for everybody to make in their own conscience and with their own God. And I think every American uh, ought to have equal rights. There's talk of $200 billion federal deficits for the next several years, certainly through 1984 and beyond. If elected president, how would you reduce those deficits? Let's keep in mind uh, uh, a piece of irony that uh, is almost beyond belief. A president uh, who campaigned in 1980 on a straight-out pledge to balance the federal budget is now presiding over the biggest federal deficit in the history of this country. It's going to run in excess of $200 uh, billion in this current fiscal year and maybe more next year. 
I think there are three, at least three reasons for that, and, and when I give you the reasons, you'll see the answers. Uh, first of all, the tax increase was too big. It slashed government revenues an average of $125 billion a year, and most of that went to higher income business uh, and uh, uh, higher income uh, earners in the country. Very little of it went to just the rank and file American. That was mistake number one. It contributed $125 billion to that uh, deficit. The second mistake was this entirely unjustified explosion of the uh, military budget. A military budget now in excess of $200 billion just for the Pentagon. When I came to the Senate uh, 20 years ago, the entire budget of the United States government for the military, the civilian, for everything was about $90 billion a year. Now it's over $200 billion uh, just for the military. We've got to knock out some of these highly expensive, complicated weapon systems if we ever expect to balance the United States uh, uh, budget. So cut and defense spending would be your approach? Cut and defense spending, no question about it. And we'd have a stronger national defense if we eliminated a lot of these boondoggles and got down to a tightly drawn, lean uh, military budget. I heard Senator Goldwater, who certainly nobody's going to call a dove, uh, say some years ago that we could save 10 or 20 billion dollars in the military budget just with a little better administration. David Stockman President Reagan's own budget director said in an interview in the Atlanta magazine a year ago that there's 20 or 30 billions of dollars of pure fat in the military budget. This is not defense, it's just waste. Um, so that's, that's step number two. The third thing we have to realize is that you are never going to balance the United States budget with 12 million people out of work. Okay, back to the phones, Montana. Missoula, Montana, you're on the air. Uh, Senator McGovern, I have a couple questions to ask you. One is being in 72, you were beat by a Republican from California. Uh, Carter was beat by a Repo or Republican from California. I was just wondering if being from South Dakota and not one of the large seven states, that was going to harm you. And also, well, just answer that question. Well, obviously it uh, helps in a national election if you come from a state of 22 million people, as uh, President Reagan does, is over against my state, which has uh, about three quarters of a million. But I think the, uh, the American people, who after all are voting in 50 states, are not looking so much at the size of the state. Uh, where the candidate comes from as they are the size of the candidate's mind and uh, the size of his vision and what it is he stands for and it's on that basis that I'm going to make my case. Montana, do you have a second question? Yes, I do. One more. Does, uh, is your platform going to be changed by the threat of a woman or a black person being a pres becoming a presidential nominee? I didn't understand. Would it, your candidacy be changed at all if a woman or a black oh, person runs? No, I, I don't think so. As a matter of fact, I think the time is long overdue uh, when women should feel free to seek the highest office in the country, and the same with black people or Hispanics or other. There's nothing in the Constitution any longer, thank God, that would uh, prevent uh, a woman or a, a representative of one of the minority groups seeking the uh, presidency uh, I personally would welcome it. I think it would enrich our political process. With 20 minutes remaining, Miami, Florida, you're next. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. My name is Hugo Alvarez. I'm calling from the Miami area. And I am a Cuban-American on the Miami area. And we see Mr. George McGovern as a pro-Castro friend of the regime of Fidel Castro. And I would like to hear his comments about if he is elected president of the United States, what are his plans in reference to the regime of Fidel Castro and Cuba? Miami, thank you much. Um, that's a good question and I appreciate it. I would try to pursue an approach to the uh, Cubans uh, roughly the same as former President Nixon pursued towards communist China. I think historians are going to hold that while it was a very courageous thing to do, and perhaps a politically hazardous thing to do, that President Nixon was right. Uh, when he went to communist China, even though we disagree with their ideology, and opened up an American embassy, 
uh, and also opened up trade, at least on a limited basis, between the two countries. One of the things that it did was to help pull the Chinese a little further away uh, from their dependence on the Soviet Union. It helped broaden their degree of independence somewhat. And I think it's fair to say that we are getting along better with uh, communist China now, that we have an embassy there, and there is a certain amount of diplomacy and also a certain amount of trade uh, than we were when we were boycotting them economically and they were boycotting us. Uh, I believe the same thing uh, could be true with Cuba. I disagree with Mr. Castro's ideology. I don't like communism as a way of life. But I recognize that the same logic that led to the decision to open up relations with the biggest communist country in the world probably uh, applies also to Cuba. I think the present policy that we have followed under Democrats and Republicans alike the last 20 years has tended to uh, drive Mr. Castro into a tighter and tighter dependence on the Soviet Union. He's turned to them for trade, for aid, for diplomatic uh, recognition. I think it's quite possible that uh, people like yourself who understand uh, Cuba and know something about the problems there uh, would have a better chance uh, to exert an influence on developments in Cuba if we had free movement of peoples between the two countries, uh, if we did have diplomatic relations with uh, Havana and we're carrying on at least some form of trade. In my judgment, uh, while it probably wouldn't keep uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Castro from being a communist, it would make him a little less dependent on the Soviet Union and perhaps somewhat more cooperative uh, with the United States. At least I think it's something that's worth trying. This past Wednesday, uh, Secretary of State George Shultz testified before the House Foreign Affairs Committee on the War Powers Resolution and also the current situation in Lebanon. And we will be playing that <clears throat> or showing you that uh, hearing this coming Sunday beginning at 6 o'clock p.m. East Coast time. Phoenix, Arizona, thanks for waiting and you're on the air. Um, yes. I was wondering, these... Excuse me. Take your time. Um... These programs you're going to implement um, in for the job programs, for the unemployment yeah. and stuff, do you propose raising taxation for this, or would you take the spending out of other programs in the government? Um, mm -hmm. I, I, would do, uh, I would do both. Uh, I would cancel the 1981 uh, Reagan tax plan. I think it uh, has cost the uh, government far more than any benefit it has brought to the American people. It was supposed to stimulate jobs. It has not done that. It was supposed to stimulate savings that could be used for investment in housing and other purposes. It has not done that. So I would cancel the 1981 uh, tax cut put through by uh, Mr. Reagan and replace it with something like the uh, Bradley Gephardt fair tax bill. It's a much simpler bill. It's one that I think uh, would inspire less frantic action on the part of taxpayers to hire these fancy accountants and tax lawyers to show them how to avoid taxes. I think we would collect taxes more fairly and more simply and we'd have more revenues to deal with ki the kind of job creating public works I'm talking about. Secondly, I would slash very substantially our expenditures for weapons and uh, invest that money in job-creating programs here at home. I think it would strengthen the country and add to our security far more, for example, than doing what President Reagan wants to do, which is to spend another $100 billion on the MX missile and similar amounts of money on other highly controversial weapon systems that I think add very little to our national defense. Before announcing that you're going to run for the president a few weeks back, you were chairman of the Americans for Common Sense. What was that? Americans for Common Sense is an educational uh, public interest group that has been attempting to educate the public on the methods of these target groups that went after so many uh, members of the Congress in 1978 and again in 1980. We're also attempting to put forth a positive program on issues such as arms control, which has been a, a major focus of our concern. Uh, we are a tax-exempt, non-profit group 
uh, having gotten into this uh, presidential race, I've turned the operation of this program entirely over to uh, its director, George Cunningham, and we'll have to take a look at it at the end of the year as to whether we want to continue it. Houston, Texas, you're on the air with presidential candidate George McGovern. Go ahead, please. Uh, good afternoon. How are you all doing? Good. Yourself? I'm very fine, thank you. Uh, I voted for uh, Mr. McGovern in, in 1972. Uh, I was in college at that time. and I'm, I'm just constantly amazed anymore. I, I, I must say I would not vote for him again. Uh, I, I agree with him in a lot of... Uh, things he has to say, but a lot of things he has to say on the economy, I disagree. And I, I just can't understand the, uh, what a lot of uh, liberal Democrats say on the economy uh, just doesn't come up with the facts. For instance, they're talking about $200 billion deficits, and they're blaming it strictly on Ronald Reagan. Well, I'm not a completely a Ronald Reagan fan. I don't agree with everything he does either. But if you look at this, look at the facts here. If you take away the tax cut, and you take away the increase in the mil military budget, we'd still have 150 to 175 billion dollar deficits. Not true. Not, not that, true. that is true. No, you look at you look at, at Houston. Let's give him a chance to respond. Now let me make my statement. He's running okay. for president. Uh, let me make a statement. All right, just please make it brief, if you would, please. Uh, he talks about the military budget doubling in 10 years. That is true, but that has just kept up with inflation. We've had a doubling in prices at least in the last 10 years. Matter of fact, uh, what uh, inflation has caused prices to triple in the last 15 years, since 1967. Mm -hmm. I can't understand why, to, why Mr. McGovern doesn't look at uh, domestic spending. Domestic spending, some of these programs have Houston, gone up. I think you've made your point. I appreciate it, but we're, we're, we, we have a show and we have a lot of callers who want to call in, so let's give them a chance to respond. Thank you very well, much. Well, first of all, I'm sorry the gentleman isn't as wise in 1983 as he was in 1972, but uh, let me say with regard to uh, uh, the point that was made that canceling out the 1981 tax cut plan and also slashing military spending uh, would still leave us with a deficit of 150 or 175 billion dollars. That simply is not true. The current deficit is in excess of 200 billion dollars. 125 billion of that stems from that much loss of revenue under the uh, so-called supply side economics tax cut of 1981. That's about what it's running now in lost revenues uh, to the federal government. Also, while it's true that the uh, increase in the military budget, and it has far more than doubled uh, in the last 10 years, is partly the result of inflation, one has to ask what caused the inflation. If you look back over the last uh, 20 years, you will see that through the 1950s and the first half of the 1960s, we held the inflation rate in this country pretty well under control. It was somewhere around two to four, four percent, sometimes as high as five, but nothing like the double digit inflation we've had in recent years. When the inflation cycle began to go out of control was 1965, and that was the year we decided to escalate the Vietnam War into a major war without calling for wartime taxes to pay for it. At the end of that war, instead of cutting back on military outlays, we have more than tripled them in the period since the end of the uh, Vietnam War. And I would argue that that combination of very high level of military spending, the highest in the peacetime history of the country by far, is one of the reasons why inflation has canceled out uh, some of the benefits of our, of our uh, budget efforts. We're never going to get the deficit under control. We're never going to get the threat of recurring inflation under control until we end this totally unjustified arms race that is contributing nothing to the security of this country. Boise, Idaho, with 10 minutes remaining, you're on the air with George McGovern. Go ahead, please. Yes, Senator McGovern, I would have uh, loved to have voted for you back in 1968, but unfortunately my country had me at uh, United States Marine Corps Combat Fire Base, Khe Sanh, Vietnam. Uh, my question to you, sir, is don't you find that there's a large, strong similarities between 
the siege of Quezon with our Marines in Lebanon now. And then I'm going to hang up and listen to your response. But also, uh, I think that, uh, I thank God that you're running again. Well, I appreciate that uh, very much. Let me say to this gentleman, uh, who is a Vietnam combat veteran, that there is no group of people in this country that I have felt any more compassion for uh, than I do these young men that we sent to Vietnam. They didn't design that war. They weren't the ones that decided the strategy. Uh, they weren't the ones that called the shots on our decision to go in there. And they were given an absolutely impossible mission that never had been thought through uh, carefully, either by the Congress or by the executive branch of our government. I'm afraid that we're stumbling into the same kind of thing in Lebanon today. I hope with all my heart uh, that we won't hear young men speaking uh, in uh, grieved and saddened voices like this uh, one, two, three, or ten years down the road about another tragic mistake uh, in Lebanon. It is absolutely impossible for external forces from the United States, from Italy, from France, or anywhere else to move in to the kind of hate-ridden religious war that is now raging in Lebanon and settle it. I must say, uh, to my sorrow, that much of the problem in Lebanon is a direct consequence of the unfortunate invasion by uh, General um, Sharon and uh, the late uh, Prime Minister Begin's uh, forces a year ago. I think they sowed uh, much of the chaos that now uh, exists in Lebanon and they've left us holding the bag. It's our Marines who are there to take the heat. And I just hope in the spirit of this young man who's just uh, called in and who I think has learned well uh, the lessons of Vietnam, that we don't repeat that tragedy again in the Middle East. I hope we don't repeat it in Nicaragua. I hope we don't repeat it in El Salvador and Honduras. We ought to terminate these military operations in Central America right now and get our military advisors out of there and halt these totally unjustified military exercises that are being underwritten there at the expense of the American taxpayer. Nine o'clock this evening, our live call-in guest will be uh, Sammy Merhi, who is president of the American Druze Society. He'll be with us to discuss the role of the Druze Muslim militia, as well as U.S. forces in Beirut, Lebanon. College Station, Texas, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. Just wanted to tell you how much I enjoy your programming, and I had a Thanks. comment and then a question for Senator McGovern. Go ahead. Uh, first, Senator McGovern, i got to say I was really amused a couple weeks ago by a cartoon in the Chronicle the day after you announced, noting that... Uh, your announcement would probably stop the Harold Stassen bandwagon right in its tracks. And then I had a question concerning the War Powers Act. Uh, do you feel really that the uh, vote today by the uh, Foreign Relations Committee was more an effort to uh, uh, forestall a court fight, and uh, especially regarding the uh, Supreme Court decision earlier in the year that uh, pretty much effectively gutted the War Powers Act uh, with regards to the legislative uh, veto provision? And uh, what was your comment on that? And uh, specifically whether or not this is a uh, face-saving uh, device by the Congress to uh, prevent that kind of a court fight in which uh, Reagan would uh, most clearly come out uh, the winner in any, any uh, sort of confrontation there. College Station, thanks for the call. Uh, first, on the, uh, on the question about Mr. Stassen, I think if you tried to pick out two men in American politics whose careers have been the direct opposite, it would probably be uh, Harold Stassen and George McGovern. Um, I ran for the uh, nomination for the presidency once before in 1972, and I won the nomination. I carried 10 important primary elections, including the two largest states in the Union, New York uh, and California, and I won the nomination fair and square in the only other serious bid that I've made for that nomination. Mr. Stassen, uh, by contrast, has been running for the Republican nomination, I think, ever since 1944, about the time I was uh, involved as a bomber pilot in World War II. He's been running for almost 40 years. To the best of my knowledge, he's never come close uh, to winning the Republican uh, nomination. So I think our two records are just about as opposite as any two public figures uh, can get. Now, with regard to the earlier Supreme Court decision uh, denying the authority of Congress uh, to veto executive branch uh, actions by the uh, President of the United States, 
this has not specifically been tested with regard to the War Powers Act. And I think this is a perfect time to test it. I hope the uh, uh, Congress will stick with the War Powers Act. I hope the vote today in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will be reversed. I personally would love to see the Supreme Court of the United States test this issue uh, as to whether the Congress actually has the war-making power that I think was given to it by the Constitution of the United States. I think we acted within the spirit of the Constitution when we passed the War Powers Act. Uh, if we were out of line with regard to the Constitution, now is the time to find that out in an open court test. What does your family think of you run, running for president again? Well, it's an interesting thing about uh, my family. If you had asked me that question uh, 60 days ago, I would have had to say the vote was four to two against me running. My wife would have voted against it. My three oldest daughters would have all voted against it. My youngest daughter, who's 28, and my son, who is 31, would have both voted strongly in favor. But an interesting thing happened. Um, I spent a month with them in the Great Smoky Mountains down in the state of Tennessee. We have a little cottage down there. We spent the month of August together at the end of that time, just about everybody had swung around except my wife, who frankly is still fearful. Uh, she's like most loving wives. She's worried about something happening to her husband. She thinks this is a tough game, and it is. Okay. And, we have one uh, last call we need to take here. We've got about 90 seconds left. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, uh, Riverside, California, our last call of the evening. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, for uh, Senator McGovern, I would like to uh, say that I am also a Marine Vietnam veteran, and uh, there are a majority of us that feel that we got the short end on that, not that we pulled out, but because we did pull out, and there are a majority of us that support our brothers in Lebanon, and I'd like to know what, if anything, the senator thinks we ought to fight for. Okay, we've got a little less well, than a minute left. First of all, let me say, I, I support the uh, Marines in Lebanon, too. It's not them I'm criticizing. It's the uh, policy that, uh, that sent them there and that continues them in what I believe is an impossible mission for the uh, Marines. Secondly, I supported the Marines in Vietnam. It wasn't their decision that sent them there, and I don't think they were ever treated fairly. When they came back from that war, I don't think they were given the kind of generous benefits that I received as a veteran coming out of the Second World War, and they needed even more support because this country was so divided on the issue of Vietnam that the veterans that we sent over there should have been given even more generous benefits than were given to us after the uh, Second World War. As to when uh, the United States should fight, I never had any debate about that in my own mind when American territory was attacked uh, in World War II. When those bombs fell on Pearl Harbor, I was in the recruiting office a few days later signing up for the Air Force. I would do the same thing again if my health permitted it, and we were similarly attacked. But I do not want to see American Marines or any other kind of American forces sent into these confusing revolutionary struggles that I think are going to rack the people of Central America, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia for as long as we can see into the future. We're all out of time. George McGovern, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it. I'd like to thank our viewers for joining us. Those of you who called, we appreciate it. Please stay tuned for some scheduling information.